The electrospray is the predominant ionization technique used in LCMS, certainly in both medicinal chemistry and DMP care work. It's therefore worthwhile looking in a bit more detail at how the technique works and some of the practical aspects involved when using it. In terms of learning outcomes, this talk aims to give a basic understanding of how the electrospray ionization process works. It will then look at what parameters can adversely affect that process. And lastly, as electrospray ionization is inevitably linked to a liquid chromatography inlet, to look at the impact that analytical conditions can have on the response of an analyte. The electrospray process consists of a flow of liquid or eluent through metal needle or capillary, which is held at high potential with respect to the front end of the mass spectrometer, which acts as a counter electrode. The voltage applied to the needle causes a separation of charge in the liquid phase. The liquid forms a cone shape at the tip of the capillary known as the Taylor cone, from which a jet of liquid is emitted, which gradually breaks up into charged droplets. These become smaller in size due to both solvent evaporation and columbic fission before the formation of ions which enter the gas phase. These are then taken into the mass spectrometer. The picture at the bottom shows the electrospray process in action. You can just about make out the Taylor cone at the tip of the needle. What you can clearly see is the jet of a liquid which is emitted from the Taylor cone and the dispersal of the charged droplets into this plume at the, at the end of the jet. It should be noted that the electrospray process is stable only under certain conditions and the too high or too low voltage applied to the needle or too high or too low flow rate would cause the spray to become unstable. The electrospray process is stable only at relatively low flow rates, typically 10 to 20 microliters a minute. To make the process more compatible with the flow rates typically used in HPLC and UPLC, a nebulizing gas, usually nitrogen, is used which flows concentric to the capillary needle. The gas is believed to reduce droplet size at higher flow rates and therefore increases the efficiency of ion transfer into the gas phase. In addition to the nebulizing gas, most electrospray sources also use an additional drying gas to help with solvent evaporation and heat the entire source block area for the same reason. This can be problematic for thermally labile compounds, but it does allow high flow rates of half a mil to a mil a minute to be used without requiring the flow to be split before entering the mass spectrometer. If we look in more detail at the ionization process, and in this case, we're looking at positive ion electrosprayer, there is a separation of charge caused by the voltage applied to the needle. On the Taylor cone, there's a buildup of positive ions at the surface of the cone. This leads to the emission of a stream of liquid, which eventually forms a series of charged droplets. These droplets have this sort of elongated shape, rather like a piece of chewing gum being pulled out of somebody's mouth. The buildup of charge at the surface of the droplet eventually overcomes the surface tension of the liquid and the droplet breaks up into smaller droplets. This process can be repeated a number of times until eventually ions enter the gas phase and are then taken into the mass spectrometer. The exact process by which ions enter the gas phase is still a matter of debate. There's been a number of mechanisms proposed for the production of gas phase ions including the charge residue, ion evaporation and chain ejection models. For the small molecules that we generally look at in DMPK and medicinal chemistry, it's believed that the ion evaporation model best explains the process by which gas phase ions are formed. There are a number of consequences of the ionization process and the first we look at is that of hydrophobic bias. It's been shown that hydrophobic molecules are preferentially partitioned into the smaller droplets and therefore give a proportionally high response compared to hydrophilic molecules. If we look at this idealized version of a charged droplet, 
The hydrophilic species are shown in red and the hydrophobic in yellow. Hydrophilic molecules tend to be solvated and spread throughout the droplet, whereas the hydrophobic molecules are surface active and tend to be distributed at the surface of the droplet. As the droplet splits into smaller droplets, those species at the surface of the droplet are proportionally taken up to a higher degree, and so you get a, a higher proportion of hydrophobic molecules in the smaller droplets, and this is repeated as the droplet decreases in size. This has been shown experimentally by looking at tetraalkyl ammonium salts. These salts are already ionized, and therefore it takes away the variability of the ionization process. The response of the more hydrophobic butyl chains is much greater than that of the propyl and of the ethyl and of the methyl chains. As seen in the previous slides, electrospray is sensitive to surface activity, and there are a number of ways in which the response of an analyte can be affected during the ionization process. Firstly, the presence of surface active components can reduce the concentration of an analyte at the surface of a droplet and therefore its response. This can be seen most clearly by comparing calibration curves of an analyte which has been prepared in solvent in blue against that which has been prepared in a matrix such as plasma or serum in the red. There are a number of surface active species present in plasma or serum and they reduce the response of the analyte. There are also limits on the amount of charge a droplet can hold, and this can be insufficient for high concentrations of analyte. This is seen in calibration curves by a flattening off of the curve at higher concentrations. There, also, there can also be problems in the analyte being neutralized by iron pairing agents. So for instance, trifluoroacetic acid is often used as a modifier in proteomics elements, but it can iron pair with basic analytes to lower the response. All these effects tend to be lumped under a, a general term of iron suppression or matrix effects, and they're particularly important in quantification in DMPK and bioanalysis, but perhaps not so important in the field of medicinal chemistry. Although the design of the electrospray interface has improved dramatically over the last few years, it's still the case that they work best at relatively low flow rates. This can be seen when we look at the response of protonated cocaine and plot the intensity against flow rate. As the flow rate goes much above 100 to 200 microliters a minute, the response tends to tail off. It's believed this decline is due to the production of larger droplets and a decrease in the amount of charge per droplet, both of which lead to a reduction in the amount of ions entering the gas phase. Increasing the percentage of organic solvent in electrospray generally gives a high response. Organic solvents have low surface tension, higher volatility, and are less prone to solvating ions than water. This leads to smaller droplet formation, easier evaporation, and an increase in the number of ions in the gas phase. The figure at the bottom shows the response of two compounds, protriptyline and pindolol, against an increase in the percentage of acetonitrile in the eluent. The response of both compounds has been normalized to their response in 100% water. Both show a large increase in signal as the percentage of acetonitrile goes up. But as can be seen, the effect is very compound dependent. In DMPK and medicinal chemistry, the majority of analysis is done using reverse phase chromatography using water and either acetonitrile or methanol as the organic eluent. In mass spec terms, there's relatively little difference between using acetonitrile or methanol, although a number of people think that methanol gives a slightly high response in electrospray. If we look at the effect of pH on electrospray response, we find the sensitivity usually increases when an analyte is already ionized in solution. So as a rule of thumb, basic analytes use acidic eluents and acidic analytes use basic eluents. 
This is not a universal rule, and basic compounds often ionize perfectly well in basic pH and acidic compounds in acidic aluants. One thing to be aware of is that while compounds ionized in solution may give a better mass spec response, it may prove problematic in terms of the chromatography. Only volatile additives or buffers are suitable for mass spectrometry, things such as formic and acetic acid or ammonium salts or ammonia solution. And generally you should use the lowest possible concentration of additive you can get away with. And there's typically a trade-off between the mass spec response and the chromatographic response. As a technique, the electrospray is suitable for ionizable compounds and those of moderate to high polarity. They typically form protonated ions in positive ion electrospray and deprotonated ions in negative electrospray. For low polarity compounds where protonation or deprotonation may be difficult, it's sometimes possible to form ammonia adducts or formate adducts or acetate adducts in negative ion by the addition of the appropriate ammonium salt. One other parameter worth mentioning is the declustering potential or put cone voltage, which is applied to the front of the mass spectrometer. This is used to aid in the transfer of ions from the atmospheric pressure part of the source into the intermediate vacuum region. Different manufacturers have different names for this voltage, but the effect of the voltage is effectively the same. It also helps to break up any clusters of hydrated ions trying to enter the mass spec. While it can increase the response of an analyte, it also can produce in-source fragmentation. This is an example from a Waters QTOF mass spectrometer looking at sulfur dimethoxine. The spectra has been taken at two different cone voltages, 15 and 50. At the low cone voltage, only two peaks are seen, the protonated molecular ion at 311 and a sodiated adduct at 333. The spectrum is very clean, no other peaks seen on it, on it. When we increase the voltage to 50, the intensity of the protonated molecular ion has now increased. It's almost double what it was at the lower cone voltage. The sodiated adduct can still be seen, but now we see a number of fragment ions. If we need to increase the cone voltage further, the height of the fragment ions would increase and the protonated molecular ion would decrease. The effect of the cone voltage is compound dependent and it's often worth trying to get the optimum value for each particular compound. As shown throughout the presentation, the electrospray process can be affected by a large number of variables. This talk has given a very simplified view of the ionization process and there's a huge amount of information available online for those wanting to find out more.